Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy here in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And we welcome you. We're grateful that all of you from around the world could join us. We are live coming to you from the shrine. It's kind of fitting, I guess, because it's been raining and raining. It won't stop. So it's pretty fitting we're talking about Noah's Ark. So uh, today we're going to have a fun presentation. We're taking you back to seminary. Um, not enough study is done on the Old Testament and the meaning of it <clears throat> and the understanding of it. And today you're going to go back with us to seminary to learn about the Old Testament and a huge important story in Noah's Ark. It's the things you didn't know and what we have to understand to help it help us in our life. So let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us to cleanse us as we were cleansed in the waters of baptism and in the waters of confession and the words of confession. We ask that you give us the courage to persevere in our faith and to be able to learn you more of you so we can love you more. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you. As you saw in your slide there, now it's great. I welcome the people. We have some people here with us today live here at the shrine unfortunately um I'll probably do it next week, but I'll set up the slides uh, for the inside. But today we'll only have the slides for you at home, the viewer. All right, now, Noah's Ark. We all learned it as children, <clears throat> but do we know the true story and what the meaning is of it other than a bunch of animals were put on a boat and saved from a great flood? All right. Noah is the next biblical figure, significant biblical figure, after Adam and Eve, the most significant after them. He became, he came before Abraham, before Moses, before David. He is right up there. Now we're, science is telling us about 5,000 to 7,000 years ago. And this is based on scripture, tradition, and even science. What happened? <clears throat> okay, you all know the story. The world became so wicked in sin that God had to intervene so that man wouldn't destroy himself. So he told uh, Noah what was going to happen, that the floods were going to come, and he told him to build the ark. You all know the story. So Noah built the ark, made enough room for it for uh, two of the animals of all the types of species, actually more, we'll talk about that later. And... They were on the boat for 40 days and 40 nights of rain. The waters remained for 150 days, and they actually stayed on the ark for a year. Could you imagine being on that thing for a year with all those animals? We're going to talk about all of that. <clears throat> then, the good news. He gave the dove, um, left, uh, released a dove, and the dove came back with an olive branch, showing that there was land. But once they landed, was everything good now? Was everything cleansed by the waters? Not exactly. There's a lesson for us, and that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, so let's look at our next slide. This story of Noah comes from Genesis chapter 6 through 9. And look at your slide on your screen. Noah was spared with his sons. He had three sons. Now, wait a minute, Father, there's eight people in that picture. All right, so you had Noah and his wife, right? Then you had three sons, Shem, S-H-E-M, Ham, H-A-M, and Japheth, J-A-P-H-E-T-H. These were the three sons of Noah. So you had Noah and his three sons, that's four men, and their wives. So there were eight people in the ark. And this will explain, we'll later, we'll explain how the human race was able to be saved from eight people of the same family. Well, Father, what about incest? We'll talk about all that. All right, now, this is important because ark, the term ark, is a generic term used in the Bible that's applied to two different things. The first is Noah's ark, the refuge of Noah that saved him from destruction. And it's a type of church. It, it, it prefigures the church. 
The second ark, which we're going to talk about next week, actually is a type of Mary. Mary, it, the typology, it prefigures Mary, the new ark of the covenant. So the old ark of the covenant, we're going to talk about next week. So today we're talking about the ark of Noah. Next week, we're going to talk about the ark of the covenant and how that prefigures Mary. This ark today of Noah prefigures the church. So God is preparing us for the church and for Mary. We're in the church with Mary. So this is what it's all about. So we hope you can join us next year. Now, that ark that we're going to talk about next week was the housing of the Ten Commandments. You might know that. And again, we'll go into more detail. Now for today, though, we're going to talk about, as I said, Noah. Now, look at your next slide. The ark was commanded by God to be 300 cubits long by 50 cubits wide by 30 cubits high. Now on that article or that little um, drawing I'm showing you there, that is the time it took Noah to build the ark. It took him 75 years to build it. Well, remember, the guy was 600 years old, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So 75 years wasn't that, that much for him. But we'll talk about he lived in 950, so we'll talk about that. But we'll look on the screen at this slide here. This was based on a cubit being 20 and a half inches long. So that would have made the ark about 515 feet the size of a battleship. So could you imagine Noah's basically building a battleship? Now let's look at our next slide. However, the most traditional size of a cubit, you know how big a cubit is? Put your hand up from your elbow to the tip of your finger. Right here, from your elbow to your tip of your finger is a cubit. That's the traditional length, about 18 inches. That is the traditional form. So in that case, the, the ark would have been about 450 feet long. That's one and a half football fields. So let's take a look at our next slide to compare. As you see, it is longer than two jumbo jets. Look at the ark there. Longer than a submarine, right? Longer than two jumbo jets, as you can see it sitting there. And let's go to our next slide. Because another comparison is that it's the length of a football field and a half. So look at that. They put the football field next to the Ark of the Covenant to give you a scale. It would have taken two and a half football fields. Now, I'm sorry, one and a half football fields. Now, I'm going to show you a lot of slides here in the beginning, but then the slides calm down. Next, let's look at our slide of Noah building the Ark. Jewish tradition says that God placed lions and wolves and tigers and ferocious animals to guard Noah when he built the ark because the wicked people were mocking him and were going to really probably attack him. So to guard Noah and his family from the wicked people, God gave them the tradition of the animals to be able to protect him. Now, what was the ark made out of? The Bible tells us it was made out of gopher wood. And nowhere else is that ever mentioned. So what is gopher wood? It's like a cypress. The cypress is mentioned a lot in the Bible. And it had three stories. So the ark had three levels. And we'll talk about the importance of that in a minute. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look at this. Here's a picture of those three levels. Our next slide. Now, some say that wild animals were on the first level. So you have the first level where some theologians say that was the wild animals. On the second level was birds and domestic animals, like your cats, right? So you had your dogs and your cats and your birds on that second level. I'm one of the few guys that likes cats, so I had to laugh. Um, the domestic animals and the birds were on the second level. And humans and the supplies were on the third level. So Noah and his family and all the supplies were on the third level. This is what some say. Now then what happens? So they get ready to launch. The rains begin. 40 days and 40 nights. Now in biblical terms, that just means a long time. 
Doesn't necessarily mean exactly 40, 24 hour days. It could. We are free to believe that. But it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and the waters, as I said, remained for 150 days. Now, after a full year on the ark, it came to rest on our next slide, Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat. So there's a picture of the sacred mountains and Mount Ararat there on your screen. Why is this important? All right, let's look at our next slide. Again, I'm throwing a lot of slides at you. Sorry, in the beginning here. This is the headwaters of the Tigris and the Euphrates River. You've all heard about that in the Bible. Way down into the Holy Land or Egypt and whatnot. But do you know where it comes from? The headwaters are right there. Look at our slide. You see that land there. There's a picture of the site of Noah's Ark, where the red middle is. Now, let's look at this. <clears throat> Turkey is to the west, all right? Now, Iran is to the south. It's actually in Armenia. This is where Noah's Ark landed in Mount Ararat. So we're looking at the slide right now. Now, the picture of Noah's Ark is over the Black Sea. The Black Sea is important because that's what flooded, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So you see the Black Sea above, where it's kind of covered with Noah's Ark's picture. But it's there at the border of Turkey and Armenia. <clears throat> and this is where it landed. All right, now let's go to our next slide. Again, a couple more. There have been many claims for people finding the Ark, but no definite scientific proof. No scientific proof definitely that Noah's Ark has been discovered yet. However, look at that slide. There's a lot of pictures of things that look like could be an ark. Here you have a front of what looks like a boat, the rear of what looks like a boat, and the fact that it's the exact biblical length of the ark. You even see the sides where they have timbers. And so this is very possible that these could be the ark, but it's never been proven. All right, so many claims. Now, let's keep going. Whether or not the story of Noah's Ark, here's the key point. When people mock the Christian faith for believing in fairy tales, and they say, science has never proved Noah's Ark is true, here's what you got to say. It sounds strange, but it's true. Here's what you say. Whether or not the story of Noah's Ark is 100% factual. That's debatable. We embrace it as true. Wait a minute, Father. True and factual are the exact same thing. No, they're not. What are you talking about? All right. Something can be true without it necessarily being factual. All right. After my talk today, I got a million things to do. Am I lying? No, it's true. But if you went around with a paper and pen and actually wrote down the exact same things, there wouldn't be a million. So it's true that I have a million things to do, but it's not factual that there's actually exactly a million. We use figurative speech, metaphors. I have a ton of work on my desk. That doesn't mean it's 2,000 pounds. It means there's a lot. It's metaphor. It's figurative language. All right, so the church insists that the Bible is inspired and inerrant. It's true. That is what it teaches is the truth. But it uses in the truth of God and our relationship with him, it uses figurative language. Now, what's the truth then, Father? All right, it's truth about God and our relationship with him. When we sin, it's as, it's, it's as if we are drowning. It's as if we're drowning. And so God will spare us, how? Through the wood, like the ark. For us now, it's Jesus on the cross. And through water. In the Old Testament, it wiped out all the evil and brought a new creation. Now in the church, the water brings us baptism. It wipes out the old sin. So you see the point? Noah was saved through wood and water, the wood of the ark and the water that wiped out the evil of the land. We are saved through wood, the wood of the cross, and the waters of baptism. Just like Noah, we can be saved. Our church is now the ark. 
For the people who are here with us today, they could look up and see the church is actually like a shape of an ark. This is powerful stuff. The flood brings about a new creation, cleansing the old world of the blood stain of violence. What was the violence that the world had to be cured of? Cain killing Abel, spilling blood. Now mankind was defiled. The story of Noah and the Bible uses, as I said, a lot of figurative language, but it doesn't mean it isn't true. It does express a truth. Maybe not literal in the sense that we think of it, but it is the truth. So when scripture says, I'll give you an example. Scripture says, God is my rock. Psalm 18, verse 2. Are we to believe that God is actually a rock? Hmm. It's figurative language. Like a rock, God is strong, steadfast, solid, and he can be leaned on just like a rock. In the Bible, we treat God like a man so that we can understand him because we are men. All right? But it says God can't be moved by emotions. God cannot be moved by emotions or repent. He can't. God never changes. But the Bible says God was angry and then after the flood repented. That's because we put him into our terms. It's figurative language that explains him so that we can understand him. But God doesn't change. He didn't literally repent, but it helps us to understand him. All right? God does not change as man does. That's Malachi 3.16 or 3.6. And God does not repent as man does. That's Numbers 23.19. So does the Bible lie when it says that God was upset or that he later repented? No, because again, we're explaining him in our terms. All right, so do we read, the question then is, do we read the Bible as literally true? Well, Father, based on what you just said, no. Yes, we do read the Bible as literally true. It is true that mankind was sinning and God had to correct it and God had to bring about a cleansing of the earth. Whether how he did it is figurative, but the fact he did it is true. So we read the Bible as literally true. Okay, if that's the case, then go home tonight and cut off your right hand, right? Why? Well, the Bible says if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Father, you're telling me that that's literally true? Okay. We read the Bible as literally true. Yes, meaning if something in your life is causing you to sin, get rid of it. That's what it means in that passage. But we don't read the Bible as literal lists, meaning I actually get out a saw and cut off my right hand. That's reading the Bible as literal lists. We don't do that. It's literally true if something in your life is causing you to sin, get rid of it. But you don't read it as a literal list that you actually saw your hand off. You get the point? Okay, this sets the stage for Noah. All right, now, we read the Bible, as I said, as literally true. So it, it is true in the Bible that Noah, his story, that sin was offensive to God. That's true. And God had to do something about it. So while it is true that God was not pleased, we can't be literalists and think every single little essence is exactly historical fact. It's truth, but spoken in figurative way. Now, the Bible puts thoughts and actions of God into human terms so we can understand. I just explained that. We are anthropomorphizing God. Anthropomorphic. What does that mean? We take God and give him physical features like us, physical mind like us, to help us to know him and trust him. It says, in Exodus, God had hands. In Hosea, he had arms. In Exodus, he had feet. In Daniel, he had white hair. Psalm 27, he had a face. Now, does God have hands, feet, arms, hair? No. Not the Father not the son, uh, Holy Spirit, they weren't incarnate. Now you could say Jesus was because he was incarnate, but God is a spirit, the Father and the Holy Spirit especially. And so they are one God, but this is not the way we think of God, but it's the way we understand him. All right, now, God is obviously upset, it says in the Bible, so it rained for 40 days. Upset meaning in human terms. 
So God is upset. It rains 40 days. This is symbolic of a long time. All right, a period of testing. It's also not just a long time, but it's a period of testing. God is going to test us. That's why the Jews were in the desert for 40 years. It was a period of testing. That's why Moses was on the mountain for 40 days. It was a period of testing. That's why Christ went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. It was a period of trial for him, testing. It's a long time. Our pilgrimage on earth is a time of testing. So it floods, right? But the waters recede and we bring about a new creation. This closely parallels the story of Adam and Eve, creation. It's a cycle of creation, destruction, and recreation. What happened to Adam and Eve? They were created. What happened? Sin destroyed them. What happened? God recreated them, breathed life. Then they got broken. Then God recreated with the promise of a savior and the gift of a mother. We see the same thing with Noah. This same kind of thing. It cleanses. There's a cleansing of the old and the blood stains of violence with Cain killing Abel. So there are parallels to the creation story. They're very similar. How? The land forms out of the deep water in both Adam and, and Noah. Noah and his family are blessed, made fruitful, and told to multiply, just like Adam. Man's dominion over the animals is reaffirmed. He said, into your hands they will be delivered. Guess what? Noah also tills a garden. Noah's put in charge of a garden, just like Adam. And everything is given to you as food, the animals. So it's a new creation. Just like Adam and Eve, they broke it. They came back, but man sinned again. So God has to recreate it. This is what we see going on. Now, God brings a greater good out of this evil. The flood foreshadows, as I said, baptism to cleanse man of sin. And this is the most powerful lesson we have to learn. The family of Noah, as I said, is saved. Now, in the same way, we are saved. How are we saved? The same way, water and wood. Baptism and the wood of the cross. Baptism cleanses our heart from sin and renews us in the spirit. What is that spirit? The church. The ark is a foreshadowing of the church. Father, we don't need the church. The Bible doesn't say we need the church. Really? If you say the Bible doesn't say we need the church, you don't understand the Bible. Christ makes it clear that I founded the church. Christ makes it clear. But even before that, Noah's ark was preparing us for the church. And there's no salvation outside of it. So let's go on here. This is important. Now, what happened? Every kind of animal was brought into the ark, just like every kind of believer from all nations is brought into the church. Let's look at our next slide. Here you see the animals getting on to the ark. It says in the Bible to bring seven pairs of animals. Wait a minute. I thought the Bible always said two pairs. Now you're telling me it says seven pairs? Yes, seven pairs, while other animals, they were to bring one pair. Why? The single pair are unclean animals, and they will go to repopulate the earth. The seven pairs are clean, and they are needed for sacrifice on the ark. And when they land, when they land, Noah begins to offer sacrifice. So here's what's going on. Tradition tells us that when the animals were lining up for the ark, there was no designation back then between clean and unclean. But now God is making a designation. Some are clean, some are unclean. You know how they knew? Tradition says when the animals lined up, the clean animals bowed. They bowed down before Noah, before they went into the ark. And this was to tell which ones were clean and unclean. Now, what's interesting is scientists at the University of Leicester determined that it was possible to hold over 70,000 animals in an ark this size. So it is possible. Let's look at our next slide. 
Actually, you know what? No, it's not a slide. It's a video. This video is three and a half minutes, and it tells you the scientific support for the ark and even how all the animals could fit in it because we only needed one of a species, and all the species we know today come from single sets of animals. So let's watch this video clip. It's only three and a half minutes long. Uh, some people believe Noah's Ark is on the top of Mount Ararat in Turkey. What's interesting is on Mount Ararat itself, they found pillow lava, which is a unique formation that occurs only when molten lava emerges from the earth below water. And they've also found salt crystals on Mount Ararat, Ararat which could only be formed underwater. Uh, is there any written evidence for a worldwide flood? Well, the flood account is found on Babylonian, Akkadian, and Sumerian cuneiform tablets, and these all date back to about 700 BC. In fact, a study of universal flood traditions reveals that there are over 200 accounts in every civilization and culture around the world, including the Inca, Inca and Aztec cultures. Uh, they've gone back to many of these ancient civilizations and found that they are very advanced, having things like natural ventilation, air conditioning. You could go back to Egypt and, found that, and find that they knew how to make batteries and generate electricity. Uh, people said for electroplating, didn't they? Yes, electroplated artifacts they found. Uh, the size of the ark, they took a model uh, of the ark and they tested in marine laboratories and they duplicated 200 foot tidal waves and they found that the ark was not only seaworthy but extraordinarily stable and during World War II the USS New Mexico and Oregon were built on the same proportions as Noah's ark six times longer than it is wide and uh, someone says that how could you get all the animals on, t on the ark and well first of all you take the very smallest animals Dr. Kenneth Ebell, professor of biology, says, quote, each family of creatures on Earth have a single pair of ancestors. He says there are over 300 variety of dogs in the world today, but they all have a single common ancestor. And he says that there would have been ample room to load ancestors of all the species we know of today with room left over for Noah's family, food, and supply. And due to the darkness, uh, due to the storm above, the animals would probably eat less, sleep more, and be in a state of hibernation. Uh, many hundreds of people have claimed to see the Noah's Ark on top of Mount Ararat. One man was Fernand Navarra, a French demolition expert, and he brought back wood that he claimed is from Mount Ararat. And the interesting thing is Mount Ararat is a totally treeless volcano peak, volcano peak, and uh, they found that the wood he brought back doesn't grow near Mount Ararat. In fact, there's not a forest within 300 miles of the mountain. Uh, Jim Irwin was a former astronaut. And he took a very interesting picture when he was traveling with a Dutch TV crew. And they took this amazing photograph. And you can see to the left what they believe to be Noah's Ark. A French spot satellite identified a 200-foot piece of wooden object, 86 feet wide, extending over a crevasse, all this being under 60 feet of ice and snow. And so someone would say, how come someone just doesn't go on top of Mount Ararat and get the Ark? Well, the problem is that climbers have claimed that Mount Ararat is one of the hardest mountains to climb, maybe the hardest, and the ark is covered with ice, so you could walk right on top of it or over it and not know it's there. And when the Turkish government grants research permits, it's for the south side of Mount Ararat. Well, the ark is believed to be on the north side, and uh, people caught on the north side are usually arrested, and it's also the mountain's too high and too treacherous to land a helicopter expedition. And uh, on the, in the ongoing battle between the Turkish government and the soldiers there, 6,000 people have died on the slopes of Ararat during the 1990s. Okay, that's a really good video clip of a seminarian somewhere that I found and I thought was very powerful because it shows both scientific explanation as to how the Ark could have happened. We are required in, as Catholics to believe the truth in the message, but how it happened also could literally be true, or as a literalist reading, we could see that there is absolutely scientific proof of uh, uh, Noah's Ark. Now, however, some dispute this. Is the story of Noah's Ark then something that contradicts science? You know, when I was a kid, I used to watch Bill Nye, the science guy, and I... I used to watch it now, I'm disappointed in him uh, because he is set out to disprove anything based on religion. Science doesn't have to contradict religion. In fact, I'm gonna give a future talk about that. 
evolution, Galileo. These things are, the church gets a black eye. It is not what you hear in popular culture. I'm going to talk about that. The Bible and the Catholic teaching does not go against science. It doesn't. And so here, <clears throat> Bill Nye says it does. Well, let's look at why. He says that the passages in Genesis describe a whole covering of the earth, meaning that the whole entire planet was covered in water and there's no scientific evidence of a full flood that covered every square inch of the earth. So therefore, the science contradicts the Bible. No, it doesn't. In the Bible, it says the earth. Okay, well, the earth doesn't necessarily have to mean at that time it was what the people saw. I've never seen the whole earth. To me, what I see is my whole existence. Now, what do I mean by this? All right. Yes, significant geological evidence disproves that there might have been a flood over the entire planet. But there's evidence of a great flood. There's evidence of a Black Sea flood, or maybe Mesopotamian flood, at this time. Back then, many understood the earth to mean the land or region that they were familiar with. All right? So, think about the account of the flood like an eyewitness. Think about this. You look out the window. What do you see? As far as I can see, there's water. To me, it looks like the whole earth is covered. Everything I can see, north, south, east, or west, is water. It looks like it's entirely covered from horizon to horizon. The water's covered in water. It's true of what the survivors saw. It's true that that's what Noah's family saw. What looked like to them, the whole earth was covered in water. They didn't have GPS. They didn't have satellite. Now you can go on your phone and see where it's raining or not. You can see it's raining here. Does it literally mean that the whole globe was submerged? It doesn't have to. That's not the point. All right, a large local flood could also explain what Noah and his family went through. In fact, it also explains that that's why the ark didn't have to have every single animal on the earth. If the flood was in the big region around Noah, you didn't need penguins. There would have been no need for penguins in the ark because penguins were at a totally different part of the earth. So we have to understand that's not against church teaching to believe that. All right? But I always say, I think it is true. Why? Because Dr. Ballard, you know the guy that discovered the Titanic, right? Dr. Ballard, he discovered flooded living civilizations in the Black Sea near Turkey. Here's what he found. He said that the salty Black Sea, because the Black Sea today is salt, was once fresh water, and they have proof of that. And it was suddenly and instantly flooded by the sea. Whoa. They dated it around 5,000 BC. We believe Noah was between like 5,000 and 7,000 BC, where there were towns of people that disappeared instantly. Geologists have discovered that melting glaciers near the Black Sea could have caused the collapse of giant ice dams and would have released tons of water. They think this happened about 7,000 years ago. Such an event would have triggered sudden massive flooding across the entire area, which would have looked like everything to Noah and his family. This would have served as the basis for all flooding accounts in the region. Another powerful example is God only had to wipe out where the evil people lived. At this time, there wasn't probably people living in Antarctica. So God didn't have to wipe out Antarctica because mankind had not migrated down there yet. And so we have to understand this. So the Catholic Church, this is important, the Catholic Church, please don't send me letters. I am only giving you church teaching here. All right, my opinion is totally in line with it. I totally agree with all church teaching, but it's not just my opinion. I'm giving you church teaching, and the church does not require that you believe 
that it was an entire worldwide flood. The church does not require you believe that. Also, it does not prohibit you from interpreting it as a worldwide flood. In other words, you can choose to believe that or not. The fact is that God had to cleanse and he did it through water. How he did it and how much, we don't know. But the church says that's not what's important. The fact that he cleansed us and he used water is what's important. So we know that this is a true story, but how is up for debate. Let's look at our next slide. I think this is important. Others say this, Father, this is story of, I get this all the time. People say the Bible is false because it's just a copy. It's a copy of Gilgamesh. Look at your screen. What is Gilgamesh? This is a telling of a Babylonian myth. All right. And people will blame the Bible for saying, well, the Bible isn't true. It's just a story of what already existed. Well, there's not a problem with that. What do I mean? All right. Yes, there's many similarities between the story of Gilgamesh and the ancient cultures even before Noah. All right. In that story of Gilgamesh, the council of gods flooded the earth and selected one man to survive who released a bird who found land. Then he landed and offered sacrifice to the gods. That's exactly like Noah. Well, gee, Father, that's why I'm not Christian. The Bible's just a copy. It's not a true story. Well, that doesn't make it not true. The fact that this is the way God works. Yes, the author of Genesis, they think was Moses plus the Holy Spirit, may have used popular stories that existed at the time in other flood narratives in order to show how God of Israel was superior to those pagan gods of Gilgamesh. It's by design God used that story. It's not because it's not true. It's because God did that. For example, as I said, Gilgamesh, in that story, the gods are afraid of the flood and they flee. Is that what happens in our story with Noah? No. In Genesis, God is in complete control. He's not afraid. He's unaffected by it. That's why, look at our next slide, are the words of Pius XII. <clears throat> Pius XII said in Humani Generis, quote, if the ancient sacred writers have taken anything from popular narrations, which is other stories, and he said, and this may well be the case, this may be conceded, it must never be forgotten that they did so with the help of divine inspiration through which they were redeemed, I'm sorry, through which they were rendered immune from any error in selecting and evaluating those documents. What does that mean? Basically, Pope Pius XII is saying that the author of Genesis could have used those other narrative stories to show our God is the real God. To show that, yes, those things happen, but they happen through our God, not your God. There is no your God. There's only the God. So God could have used these stories from which people were already familiar with. The fact that the author chose to model his story, Noah, meaning the author being Moses and the Holy Spirit, after existing stories does not disprove the message. It doesn't make it null and void. People keep writing me, telling me it makes the Bible null and void. No, it doesn't. That is the truth. That was the truth that it was God and not any other pagan gods who intervened to save the survivors of the flood that devastated the land. You get that? God has taken an existing story and he's putting himself in it. He's saying, I want to tell you the truth of how that story happened. Just because Gilgamesh told it doesn't mean it's not true. It's true. But what the Bible is telling you is the truth of behind the scenes is God, the God. Now from it, we get the covenant with Noah. They call it the, Noah, the Noahic covenant. Let's look at our next slide. Here is the Noahic covenant. 
the covenant with Noah. Now, this is where we get interesting. It's going to affect everybody today. God promised never to destroy life on earth again by a flood. And he created what? You see it in the picture? A rainbow. A rainbow. All right, so when you could take the slide down. That is interesting. God created the rainbow as the sign of this everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Now, in return, Noah and his descendants were required to never again sh shed human blood, like Cain killing Abel, because mankind was made in the image of God. We are not to shed it. That's why even abortion is wrong. So mankind was forbidden to consume meat, even from the animals with blood in it. Man was not to shed blood because blood is the life of the being, the creature. So blood must be drained from the animal before consuming it. That's why the Jews eat koshered meat. That's what kosher means, no blood. Now, the covenant with Noah was a renewal of the covenant with Adam. It was not a new one. It was not an entirely new covenant. It was a renewal. Now, God took upon himself to maintain man despite our sinfulness and showing his love for us despite our brokenness. This is why in your life today, people say to me, Father, God can't love me. I'm too sinful. I can't go to church. I'm a hypocrite. If God can turn around and show us how much he loves us by not destroying mankind, but saving it, which he did through water and wood, then we can know that he can do the same for us now. The water of baptism, the wood of the cross. Now, what about the rainbow? The rainbow was a sign of the covenant with Noah. Do you know where it comes from? Why the rainbow? Because Genesis 9, 13 says, God hung up his bow in the sky. So if God was like an archer with a bow that struck mankind, he had to do it. Now he's hanging up his bow. He is saying, I will no longer, like an archer, strike. I am hanging up my bow. That in the sky is the rainbow. This is Genesis 9, 13. But sadly, the rainbow has been hijacked. Right? We're entering June this week, coming up. And June is called Pride Month, where homosexuality is celebrated and the rainbow is the symbol. They claim that it is against Christianity because they want to be inclusive. And people who oppose it on moral grounds are subject to lawsuits, fines, and hate crimes. I'm not going to talk about that today, but all I want to say is this. Remember, the church calls all people to chastity, in marriage or out of marriage, man or woman. It is not discrimination. The church calls all people to be sexually pure. Whether or not you're heterosexual, homosexual, married, unmarried, you are called to purity. We have a church to guide us in all our matters of life so that we can be saved. It's not discrimination, it's salvation. If anybody says to you the church does nothing but discrimination, no, the church does nothing but salvation. So there's a total misunderstanding on that symbol. Topic for another time. But we will say this, the church fathers, let's look at our next slide, the church fathers showed the ways that the ark, the ark of Noah prefigures the church. Look at your screen. That's what we see on the screen. All right, this is interesting. How does the ark tell us that we need the church today? All right, there's no safety outside the ark. You're outside the ark, you're not going to make it. Stephen Ray says non-Catholics are kind of like on little life rafts outside the ark. They're still with us, 
but we want to get them on board because the ark is the Catholic Church. Now, nobody can saved who is not in some sense with the church. If you're not in some sense with the ark, either in it, meaning in the Catholic Church, or next to her, like some non-Catholic Christians on life rafts, there's no salvation. we got to get the safety of the ark. St. Cyprian said no one could escape the deluge outside of the ark, and no one outside the church will escape life's deluge. Just as the ark was the means by which Noah and his family were spared destruction, so also the church is the instrument by which Christians are saved, especially through baptism. This is powerful. All right? Now, let's look at our next slide. 1 Peter 3.20. A passage very few people ever think of, but you can't get more powerful. What does it say? When God's patience... Now, this is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah, this is Peter talking, St. Peter. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water, baptism. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Oh, but Father, we don't need the church for salvation. Peter told you. He's telling you right here. Baptism, which corresponds to this, meaning the waters of Noah, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> How could you get more proof than that? So when people say to you, you don't need the church for salvation, point to 1 Peter 3.20. This is powerful. This is where the apostle writes that the flood itself anticipated the sacrament of baptism. And you only get the sacrament of baptism through the church. Now in the case of death and others, yes, you could do it, but that's a whole other topic. Now let's talk about what the church father said. This is fascinating. All right. Now, to me, one of the greatest church saints is St. Augustine. All right? St. Augustine said this. The ark represents the primary means of salvation. All right? <clears throat> and it equates to the New Testament as well. The wood of the cross and the waters of baptism by which original sin is wiped away. Now he says, Noah and his family and all the animals entered the ark through a door on its side. Genesis 6.16. This in the same way as how we enter the church <clears throat> through the side of Christ, which was pierced on the cross, releasing blood and water. Now Augustine goes on and says something fascinating. He says the ark matches the body of Jesus. And you know what? They measured it on the shroud of Turin, and it matches. Do you know the ark is in the shape of the body of Jesus Christ? What are you talking about, Father? Okay, the ark from front to back was 300 cubits. From side to side was 50 that is six times longer. Christ's body on the shroud from head to toe is six times longer than from side to side. It also says, Augustine says, that it is ten times from the height of the, or the front of the ark to the end of the ark is ten times greater than the height of the ark. The height of the ark was 30, 10 times greater is 300. Now what's fascinating in the human body, if you measure your body, most average human proportion from head to toe 
is 10 times greater than your girth. And it is five times greater than your width. Now that doesn't apply to everybody because some of us, even myself, are a little bit overweight. But we are working on that. Praise be to God, my knee finally feels better. I'm getting back into working out today, actually. So I want to get my ratio back into 10 to 1 and, 10 <laughs> and 6 to 1. Because this matches Christ on the shroud. Fascinating, isn't it? This is awesome. All right, Augustine said, The very ratio of the dimensions of the ark to each other suggests a human body, specifically the body of Christ. For even its very dimensions in length, breadth, and height represent the human body in which he came, as it had been foretold. For the length of the human body, from the crown of the head to the sole of the feet, is six times its breadth from side to side, the exact way of the ark. And ten times from head to toe is ten times greater than back to front. And he says, and 10 times its depth or thickness measuring from back to front. The ark is the church and the church is Jesus Christ. The church is the body of Christ. The ark is measures to the body of Christ in proportion. Now Christ wasn't 300 cubits tall, but you see the connection. Now, what about the fact that no nails were used in building the ark? Kind of like the miraculous stairs of Loretto with St. Joseph, right? No nails were used in the construction of the ark. Well, how's that possible, Father? It was held together by what they call pitch. It's like a ceiling. For St. Augustine, this symbolizes the way the churches hold together, by love. Now, what's interesting is St. Cyprian he went on to say there's only one church, just like there was only one ark. Not a fleet of ships. They didn't build a whole army or navy of ships. There was one ark, just as there is one church. And Noah was saved by it. And so are you. There's one church, one baptism. All right, last bit here. We're getting near the end. Hang in there with us. Hippolytus of Rome, he weighed in on this. He said that the ark represents the Christ because it had a door on the east side of the ark and Christ will come from the east when he comes again. Now let's look at our next slide and hear what origin the church father has to say. See the three levels of the ark? All right, Origen said there's three levels of the ark and it matches church tradition of the spiritual life. You've heard me teach you the three levels of the spiritual life. Purgative, illuminative, and unitive. You can be saved by any one of the three, but you want to progress up. You want to climb up the levels of the ark. The ark has three levels. He said the first is purgative. What is purgative? Purgative means you can be saved simply because you fear hell. And you don't want to go there, so you avoid mortal sin. You can be saved that way. It's not the best way, because it's kind of a self-focus, but it's enough to save you. If you die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin. So it's the first level, is like the purgative way. The second level is the illuminative I'm saved because I want to go to heaven because there's something good. Heaven is goodness, and I want goodness. I don't want evil. I want goodness. I want something in it for me. So that's the second level. It's not the best, but it's enough to save you. But the ultimate level is the unitive way, which means you are saved solely and purely out of love of God. You don't care about anything else you don't, care, you don't care about anything. Now, it, means that it doesn't mean that you don't go to work and go get your education and, 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 and have a home. Yes, you got to do all those things. It doesn't mean those are unimportant or you shouldn't do them. Of course not. But they all lead you to union with God, 
When union with God becomes your most primary point of existence, you've now hit the top of the spiritual life and you fulfilled your telos, which is the reason what you were created. The Baltimore Catechism says, why were you created? To know God, love him, serve him, and be united with him forever in heaven. The ark represents this. The ark is a prefigurement of the church. In the church, we, we move from the purgative to the illuminative to the unitive. Through the help of the saints and the sacraments. You know, some other saints said that the three levels of the ark represented hell, earth, and heaven. It's kind of the same way. You want to progress up. And so this is very, very important. Now, St. Jerome, he saw the dimensions of the ark, 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits, as significant. He says, in the Hebrew, 300 is connected with the cross, because the word for 300 and the word cross share the very same root word, because of a prophecy in Ezekiel 9, 4. Then he went in and said, 50 is an important number because it's penitential. Psalm 50 is penitential. So he said, 50 is important. And finally, he said, 30 is important because 30 is how old Christ was when he was baptized and began his ministry. So in a sense, these three numbers represent the whole compass of spiritual life. 350 and 30. The ark was 300 cubits by 50 cubits wide by 30 cubits high. This is interesting. Now, in a sense, these three numbers represent everything. And quote, he said, through penance, we arrive at the mystery of the cross and we reach the mystery of the cross through the perfect word that is Christ. Jesus represents this. All right, now Genesis 8, 1. Let's talk about this. We're talking about the church now, right? We're talking about how the ark of, the, of Noah prefigures the church. You can go right to Genesis 8, 1. God made the wind blow over the earth and the water subsided. What was the wind? The Holy Spirit. Now, how are we saved? Through the water. And the water was birthed at the birth of the church. Remember when Pentecost happened, the church was born of blood and water. Blood is life. Water is cleansing. So this is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is given to us through the church in the same way. And so you see this connection is amazing. You guys are doing great. Hang in with me. We're almost done. A couple more minutes. Now this, however, raises a question. Father, if everything you're saying is true, why are we still in such a mess? If the ark is everything you said it was, and the church is everything you say it is, why are we still in a mess? All right, good question. The floodwaters receded, cleansing the earth, cleansing the home of man, but it didn't cleanse the heart. It cleansed the home, but not the heart. That's why Jesus said in Scripture, beware, because you can cleanse your house and yet seven more demons will come and infect it. If you don't clean the heart, it's going to get messed up. The problem was we didn't cleanse our heart. Our heart remained unchanged. Just as Adam's family split, how did Adam's family split? Do you remember Adam's kids? Cain, Abel, and Seth, S-E-T-H. What happened? Cain killed Abel. They split. Seth was a good man. Cain was bad. So there were two children, Adam and Eve. Cain kills Abel. You got Cain the bad, and you got Seth the good. And they split. What happened with Noah? Noah had children as well. You had Shem, who was good, and you had Ham, H-A-M, who was bad. They split. Now, why does this make an importance? Let's take a look at our next slide. Genesis tells us that there were problems. Noah got drunk. 
<laughs> and it says right in the scriptures, Noah got drunk and Ham saw his nakedness. What does that mean? All right, theologians tell us it means either he had homosexual incest relations and violated Noah, his own father. He can't even imagine how vile that is. Or he had relations with his mother, according to Scott Hahn. So Ham, the son of Noah, they land. Noah's offering sacrifices. But just like a sinner, he falls, he gets drunk. Ham sees his nakedness. And it says Ham violated that. Some scholars think he homosexually, incestually violated Noah. Again, horrible to even think of. Other accounts, Scott Hahn, and say it was a motherly incest, which is also horrible. And then he had incestual relations, sexual relations with his mother. Now, why? Why would Ham do this? He did it for power. Ham was the youngest son, and he wanted to seize the power and the blessings that were meant for Shem. Shem was the firstborn son. Now, a curse happened. A curse fell upon Ham because the son that came out of that ancestral relationship, this is why Scott Hahn thinks it was an incest with the mother, the son that came from that was Canaan. You heard of the Canaanites? Israel's forever enemy. So a curse fell upon Ham's son, Canaan, because he was conceived through the sinful union of incest with the mother. And that bred the Canaanites, the enemies of Israel. Now, what's interesting is the split continues. Because I told you Shem was good and Ham was bad. Who came from the line of Shem? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it was Isaac, or Israel, I'm sorry, or Jacob, who descends from Shem, who was good. And he removed the Canaanites from the promised land. So you see, if we continue to turn our back on God, we don't cleanse our hearts. God will never trump our free will. We still have free will. If we cleanse our hearts, then we can get our will to do the right thing. So as we wrap up here, I do want to mention another couple of interesting points. Let's look at our next slide. You ever hear of Melchizedek? We say it in the Eucharistic prayer from the line of Melchizedek. Jesus was a priest from the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the high priest that actually bestowed a blessing upon Abraham. Some believe that Melchizedek was Shem, the firstborn of Noah. He was 465 years old. We'll talk about age in a minute when Abraham was 75. The genealogy in Genesis shows that Shem lived past Abraham. So Shem could have been Melchizedek. Shem was given the priesthood. What's the word for priesthood in Hebrew? Kahuna. I always wonder if that's where we get the word the big kahuna. But that is Hebrew. He got it from his father because he was the firstborn of Noah. Noah gave him his blessing Shem was the priest. This form of priesthood is based on the order of the family, the firstborn son. Now, isn't that also how Jesus got his priesthood? The firstborn son. So this models the heaven where Jesus is the father's firstborn. Now, to wrap up, confusion over Melchizedek was the fact that they couldn't understand, the Jews couldn't understand that he was both a king and a priest. That doesn't happen. You're either a king or a priest. We don't get this. It is solved by knowing that Shem was both a priest because he was the firstborn of Noah and he was blessed into the priesthood, was also the progenitor of the Davidic monarchy, meaning he was a king. David came from Shem. 
So Shem was both a priest and a king. And when Jesus comes, God our Savior, he's priest, prophet, and king. Wow. But what about the significance of the age? This is where I wanted to finish because it says Noah was 600 at the time of the flood. And it said he lived another 350 years. So he was 950 years old. All right. Is that true? Let's talk about that. Theologians have suggested that the first generations of humans did live that long because they had not been fully corrupted by sin generation after generation after generation that we do. We keep getting, we always think it's great to live in this time in history. And in one sense it is. God's given us more mercy. He's given us more revelation. He's given us more saints. But part of the reason he does that is because we, over generation to generation, have become weaker and weaker in sin. Where sin abounds, grace abounds the more. That's why God is flooding the world with mercy right now, because as generation goes to generation, we're getting weaker and weaker and weaker in sin. And God keeps pumping more grace upon grace upon grace into us. And he does it through the church. And so we have to understand the importance of this. So theologians have said that the first generations of humankind were more perfect, even physically, because genetic defects hadn't been passed down then generation to generation. That's why they believe Adam and Eve could have multiplied from just their children. Because you didn't have the genetic deformations. Like right now, if a brother and a sister or a cousin have relations, there's usually genetic defects. It wasn't that way back then. I know that's controversial. But that's what theologians believe. This was due to being close to the initial purity of man. Noah was way closer to the initial purity of man than we are. We are way downstream of sin. And it wasn't until over time, as more sin and corruption set in, that humanity began to physically decline. That's why we are dying now, not at 900 years old, but at 100 if we're lucky. Many say that people did live that long because the effects of sin were not as prevalent back then. Sin had not worked its way between generation after generation. This can explain why children would have been born possibly out of the children of Noah, even cousins. They could have repopulated because there wouldn't have been that genetic defect that we think of today. It also explains why Adam and Eve may have been thousands of years before Noah, even though only a few generations. Because if Noah lived 900 years, that's like 12 generations, 13, 14, 15 generations. Other theologians, and that doesn't mean now that that's the case because Noah didn't live only 100 years or 80 years. He lived 900. So instead of needing 15 generations to cover the time gap between Noah and Adam, he only needed a couple generations because they lived so long. I hope that makes sense. All right. So to wrap this up now, remember, the genealogy of Luke and Matthew may contain accuracy. They are accurate, but they may not have all the generations. This is what church theologians have told us. This is the importance, though, is that we know we come from Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are real people. They're not myth. We have to believe it. All right, let's keep going. Other theologians and scholars note that ages were not meant to be taken literally, but symbolic. The church has no teaching regarding whether these ages should be taken literally or not. It's up to you. You want to believe Noah was 950 years old when he died? You can believe that. You don't want to believe Noah was exactly 950 years when he died. You don't have to believe that. What we believe is the message of what Noah went through. The church teaches that whatever scripture says is inerrant, but must be understood in terms of the liturgy, the literature that was used at the time, including figurative language, as I explained earlier. In many ancient cultures, Long lives were given to people symbolically to show the greatness of the individual. So if a person was great, it said kings lived 10,000 years. We see that in writing. We have writing of that saying the, the great kings lived 10,000 years. 
that was symbolism to show that they were great. However, this is not something the church has taught. All right? God can keep alive people as long as he wants. If he wants to keep you alive 900 years, he will do so. But he usually keeps in line with the times. So I don't think you're going to find a 900-year-old year, grandma today. <laughs> All right. Last paragraph. Why would a merciful God kill nearly every human in a flood? Hmm. Interesting question. Without the flood, theologians tell us, humanity would have destroyed itself on its own. We wouldn't be here today without the flood. Mankind would have destroyed itself. Instead, God used the flood for rebirth, recreation. The flood was the chance for renewal. And you know, he gave every human being a chance at that. Did you know this? The flood was the chance for any human person with any goodness to start over and be saved. Noah's family was not the only example. Others had their chance to get on that ark, but they mocked Noah. Jewish tradition does not say God was uncaring. God instructed Noah to build the ark slowly. Remember, 75 years. You don't think 75 years is enough time for the other people who saw it to repent? This meant it was a last warning and chance for others to repent to accept God and his mercy. He's doing the same with us in our lives. The average lifespan, 75 years. If you live natural. It's lower than that because we have accidents and diseases and stuff like that. But if we live on average of 75 years, how ironic that that's the exact same time that God gave to all those at the time of Noah to repent and say, I want God's mercy. It took them 75 years to build the ark. All the people around, instead, they scoffed, they laughed, they mocked. What are we seeing in our world today? In the lifetime of people, they scoff, they mock, and they laugh. And this is why we have to pray for them. We are the ones building the ark, the church. And if we're the ones building the ark of the church for our safety, we want our loved ones to be on that ark. God's giving them every chance. And he may be using you to help do that. So this is the importance of the story. This was meant as a last warning and a chance to repent. God didn't block anybody from the ark, but they had to clean up before they were allowed in. It's the same with the church. Oh, Father, I don't like the church. It's discriminatory. They're telling me that I can't live my decrepit lifestyle. The church is saying, please clean up before you get in the ark. That's exactly what God said. This was what it was meant to do. Everyone had a chance to turn from their old ways and enter into the ark. You have the same chance today with the church. Well, I don't like the church's rules. You're doing the same thing then. This church is the only ark that's going to remain when it gets worse in this world. It's coming. Whether it be natural or, God promised not by a flood, but you know, a lot of saints say that there'll be destruction by fire or whatever it might be pestilence. Be ready. Get in that ark. The ark is the safety. Get in aboard. That ark is the church, but people didn't do it. That's why some saw the flood as God's tears. The massive amount of water, they said, was the result of God's tears over man's sin. Hmm. So let's get aboard. Let's look to Noah. How many of us pray to Noah? <laughs> Do you ever hear St. Noah pray for us? Well, I want to show something or say something that's interesting. Why isn't Noah considered a saint? Is Noah considered a saint? How come we don't have St. David and St. Moses? St. Abraham. Do we? Are they saints? Or are they not saints? All right. Formal canonization of saints didn't come to much years after the, finding of the founding of the church. Before that, 
Righteous people like Moses, David, Abraham, or Noah were just considered by Christian communities as holy, good people. We can call them saints, but they're not canonized in the way that St. Rita or St. Padre Pio or St. John Vianney is. But we still call them saints. Let's look at our last slide. Isn't that muddle neat? St. Noah, pray for us. And he's holding a little ark. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. He's not a canonized saint. So we don't call him saint in a canonized sense. When we do a litany to saints, we're talking canonized saints. And this didn't happen until after the church was developed. And as I said before that, saints were just considered righteous people. So that is why the Old Testament and New Testament saints, even Mary, were never formally canonized. Mary didn't need to be formally canonized but we still call her a saint. You know, when we pray, we usually say, Blessed Mother Mary. We usually don't say Saint Mary. But I bet you've been to a church called Saint Mary's. That's awesome. So Noah, he's one of these righteous people of the Old Testament who are generally considered to be in heaven. That, friends, is the message of Noah. And you know, the message of Noah is really the message of God's divine mercy. God's divine mercy was fully revealed in the New Testament. It was hidden in the old, revealed in the new. That's why I invite you to pick up a copy on our next slide. Uh, actually, this is the final slide. My book you can get called Understanding Divine Mercy. And I tell the whole story from Adam and Eve of God's mercy, starting in the garden you can get this for any donation. Father, I don't have anything more than a dollar. Dollar? You got it. Fine. You can have it. Just visit thedivinemercy.org slash UDM. And you can get it for any donation. Or you can call 1-800-462-7426. And now I want to give you a final blessing to say, please don't always just look at these beautiful stories of the Old Testament as just fairy tales. Pope Benedict never used the word myth. So these aren't myths. These are truths. How they're told can be figurative, but they're truth. And so we give you an opportunity now to read all about Noah in our new Divine Mercy Bible. At the end of this blessing, we're going to play a video clip that shows how you can get this awesome Divine Mercy Bible from shopmercy.org. If you want to read about Noah, and in this Bible, the reason it's called a Divine Mercy Bible is because we take the passages of the Bible, Old Testament too, and explain where God's mercy is. So you can go to the Bible, read about Noah, and then read a little summary of what I kind of just taught today about that passage of Noah. And where was God's mercy in the destruction of mankind. It's all in there. So at the end, stay tuned, because I'm going to show that video. It's only a minute, minute and 20 seconds, to get a copy of that Divine Mercy Bible. Until then, join us next week, as we're back with you to talk about another ark, the Ark of the Covenant. And that ark, like the Ark of Noah prefigured the church, the Ark of the Covenant prefigures Mary. So if you know anybody that doesn't believe in the role of Mary, have them tune in next week. Next Saturday, 11, we'll be back here live. We had a nice crowd here today. Hopefully we'll see you again next week as we talk about the Ark of the Covenant. And until then, may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, and I'm super excited to tell you about something you're not going to want to miss. We all need the Bible. And often I get questions from people, Father, what's the best version of the Bible to read? There are many out there. And I always say the RSVCE, which is the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. Now, not only do you have that best of versions, but now we have created together with our friends at Ascension, 
the Divine Mercy Catholic Bible. This is a beautiful leatherette Bible that has just an absolutely important message for you. Not only is it all the words of Scripture that you're familiar with, but in it, we have great contributions from people like Father Seraphim, Dr. Robert Stackpole, and others that explain exactly where you see God's mercy in each of the passages of both the Old and the New Testament. So please join me and get a copy of this incredible new Divine Mercy Bible and help you to understand the Bible from the perspective of God's divine mercy. So you can get your copy at shopmercy.org or please call us at 800-462-7426. So remember, the Word of God is imperative for salvation, and now you can get it from the perspective of God's mercy. Thank you, and we hope you'll pick up a copy.